Today's episode of Data Driven is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash data driven. Hello and welcome to Data Driven, the podcast where we explore the emerging field of data science. We bring the best minds in data, software engineering, machine learning and artificial intelligence. Now here are your hosts, Frank Lavinia and Andy Leonard. Hello and welcome back to Data Driven, the podcast where we explore the emerging fields of data science, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. If you want to think of data as the new oil, well, consider us car talk because we focus on where the rubber meets the road. With me on this epic virtual road trip through the information superhighway is Andy Leonard. How are you doing, Andy? I'm doing well, Frank. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Uh, a couple of interesting things happened this morning that uh, probably can't talk about just yet, but yeah. uh, soon, soon, my dear data drivers, soon. <laughs> I, um, I'm i privy to uh, a couple of those things, and I'm excited for you. I'm excited for the future and just the stuff you're working on, Frank. Um, you know, maybe some of our listeners don't know this, but you and I are both fans of a guy named Grant Cardone who wrote a book a few years ago called The 10X Rule. In essence, Grant says that it's going to take you about 10 times as much work as you suspect to create some value or achieve some goal. And, you know, you're going to run into maybe 10 times as many obstacles as you may think at the outset. It's a fantastic philosophy, interesting book. I recommend if anybody's going to read Grant Cardone that they purchase the audio book instead. He's a hilarious author and he reads his own writing. And there's things in the audible versions that are not in the book. And he tells you, too. He goes, oh, this isn't in the book because the editors. And his energy is so infectious. Like, you can't – I mean, I, I kind of stumbled across him accidentally. He kept doing a lot of Meerkat, uh, if you remember Meerkat yeah. uh, feeds and, and kind of stuff. And my first thought was, who is this guy? Right. He's kind of crazy. And, like, <laughs> then there was a sale for his audiobook, And then I listened to his the 10X role. And as luck would have it, I, I forget what I was trying to do. I think I was trying to get to downtown D.C. by a certain time in a day. And I swear to you, one of the things he says, it, it's always going to take you 10 times more of the effort to do anything. So you might as well 10 times your goal to make it so, like, you're more motivated to do it. And sure enough, as I'm listening to that passage, like, every conceivable obstacle – to get from where I live to downtown DC came up. I mean, motorcades, accidents. Uh, I think a bridge was washed out. I mean, it was just like, and I'm only like 20 miles away from the city. Like, I mean, it was just like, what is going on? And I, and I, and I thought back to that, you know, like, should I turn around? I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the moment that it really spoke to me. And if you were a fan of the show, or even if you're not a fan of the show, uh, we now have a partnership with Audible. So that book is available on Audible. This, I swear this is one big commercial. You can buy it any way you want. <laughs> you can go to his website and buy it. Uh, and I'm not even going to give you a link because I don't want you to think I'm you know, getting a commission on it. But if you want to support the show, go to audibletrial.com slash data driven and make that your one free audiobook. You won't regret it. I mean, it came to me at a very fortuitous. Actually, it wasn't fortuitous. It was a very bad time in my life <laughs> when I discovered it. And it helped me focus on what was important. His delivery is very unique. It is. And you turned me on to the book, Frank. I read it and I thought so much of it that we homeschool our children. I assigned it to my 13-year-old to listen to that audio book. I see him putting into practice some of the stuff in that book. You know, in a way, this podcast grew out of our, your and my motivations to do 10 times the work that we were doing previously. That's led us today to our guest, Mr. Dave Langer. Dave Langer is a veteran BI analytics and data science professional. He is currently the VP of Data Science at Data Science Dojo, focusing on growing the educational services practice. Previously, Dave was a senior director for BI and analytics at Microsoft, where he managed the team that owned the mission-critical data platforms used to run Microsoft's 10-plus billion supply chain. Dave's current passions are text analytics, event log mining, and mathematical programming. Dave holds a MS in computer science, and a BA in economic from the University of Washington. I'd like to welcome you to Data Driven and thank you for being our guest today. 
Thank you for having me. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. We have a mutual friend who was actually a guest. Let's see, by the time this show goes out, it'll probably be a few weeks since we interviewed our mutual friend. If you could talk about our friend, and, and um, I'd love for you to speak some to our, to our mutual friend. Yeah, so the person in question is the illustrious Darren Lacey. So Darren and I worked together at Microsoft, both as co-workers and also for a while, I was lucky enough to be Darren's manager for a time. Darren is a data professional extraordinaire. Uh, I actually recruited him, oddly enough. I was in Dallas doing some training on SAP's data warehousing software, BW, Business Warehouse. And there was this guy sitting with me in this class, uh, and it was being taught by the world's most bitter SAP trainer, by the way, just so you know, <laughs> this guy was, he was, he was amazing. I don't know if Darren brought him up or not. Uh, I won't name him he by didn't. name, but, uh, but it's so, so we're sitting in this classroom with like 14 other people and we're learning BW and I'm asking questions and I'm trying to a understand how to do essentially Kimball style data warehousing using BW and they're decidedly an Inmon kind of shop and, Darren himself is also, as, as am I, he, he's bigoted towards the Kimball design methodology of dimensional modeling. So uh, we were like chocolate and peanut butter. We were better together in that class, just tag teaming this poor instructor <laughs> regarding all these questions about how, you know, how do you make an info cube do this like a, a dimensional model should and that sort of thing. And uh, I, it just, Darren just struck me as being so smart and so on the ball. I, I immediately emailed my boss back in Redmond and I said, Hey, I think we found, I think we found our data architect because we had had a position open for like six months and we were bouncing wow. everybody that came in through the door. And he said, yeah, absolutely. So I took him out to dinner uh, and I said, okay, I'm going to be honest with you. I think you're awesome. I want you to come work with us at Microsoft, but let me tell you, it's, it's, <laughs> uh, it's, it's not all it's going to be cracked up to be. Just let me tell you that up front, right? Uh, sure. I'm sure, Andy, you, you've worked with Microsoft. You, you know as well, right? When, once you're inside the big house, it's not always how it looks like from the outside. But that's true for any big company. Yeah, uh, I was going to say that. It, it really is. And at the time we're recording this, this is the end of June. Um, Darren would have been on our first show in July, the first week of July. And um, I have been editing that show this week. Uh, just before we started recording this one, Dave, and it's a fantastic show. I encourage you to listen to it. It's not out yet, so you haven't heard it, but you'll enjoy it. It's a lot of what I consider kind of typical Darren. I agree with everything you said. He's a dynamo, uh, super smart, great guy. And I'm really glad you recruited him to Microsoft because I, I think he's in a really good spot. He's actually doing a lot of good there for supply chain. And, um, you know, I, I just, I can't say enough nice things about him. He's He's more than just an acquaintance or someone I actually work for and with. He, he's a friend. Hey, Andy. Yeah. We know some people. Maybe we can get Dave early access to that episode. We do know some people. We could actually <laughs> ship over the MP3 <laughs> or MP4A as the case may be. <laughs> yeah, I will definitely listen to it because Darren and I still have lunch approximately every month or so since I've left Microsoft. Uh, he's a good friend and a, a hell of a guy. He he picked up his family and moved out to the, the West Coast, completely different culture, different, you know, both corporate as well as just the city in general, the Seattle area. They've just flourished here in the Puget Sound area. And he, I can't say enough about the guy. I just love him so much. <laughs> that's, that's fantastic. Well, tell us a little bit about what you do these days, Dave. In February, I started a, a new adventure. So I left Microsoft and joined a small startup called Data Science Dojo. And our speciality is training working professionals on data science. Our, our current product offering is a five-day intensive boot camp where we bootstrap folks that are interested in learning foundational data science skills into uh, a collection of uh, the 20%, if you will, of data science that is 80% useful, uh, you know, the 80-20 rule in effect. So I've been doing that since uh, the beginning of February, and uh, I've just been having an absolute blast just geeking out on data science all day, every day. That's how I found you, basically, was I had seen that you had done some videos on YouTube, and you, you, you made a statement that, that we here at Data Driven firmly believe in, is that data science is for everyone. It's not just for the hallowed halls of academia. 
but it, it is something that is applicable and very understandable to the everyday software engineer or uh, data engineer. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the, the Data Science Dojo motto, excuse me, the, co the corporate mission statement is data science for everyone. And before joining Data Science Dojo, I had created a YouTube channel and had a seven-part tutorial series introducing data science using R precisely for a very broad audience, right? I, I didn't really worry about focusing on the math or the statistics. It was essentially, here's how you do data analysis in R. Here's how you build models. Here's how you ev evaluate features. And here's how you can actually build a, a model that's potentially useful in your business. The philosophy that underlied that video series is exactly the way Data Science Dojo thinks about the world. So once again, not to sound like a corporate shill here, but chocolate and peanut butter, better together. <laughs> you know, Andy, we should see uh, if we can get the Reese's company to uh, kick in some sponsorship money just well, for all their uh, Of course. Since we're doing all this advertising for them, yeah, we should. <laughs> <laughs> So what was the focus of your YouTube series, and how is that different from what you're doing now at Data Science Dojo? In a very real way, there's there's not a lot of conceptual difference. Uh, it's just a matter of the level of detail. The first video series that I did on YouTube was, by design, very high level. For example, I leveraged the mighty random forest algorithm in the video, but I didn't bother explaining how it worked in detail. During our boot camp at Data Science Dojo, I actually explained to folks why the random forest algorithm is actually mighty, the various statistical properties, the way it's implemented, and why it achieves the levels of performance that it does, and why it's a go-to algorithm for companies like Microsoft and Quora, for example. In spirit, they're essentially the same. Hey, let's target a broad audience of folks. Let's bootstrap them into some actual practical hands-on skills that they can use in their daily work. The boot camp just goes into more detail than my video series did. I was at the, the Machine Learning and Data Science Summit last summer mm -hmm. uh, out in uh, sunny Redmond, Washington. I kind of had a lot of aha moments out there. And it was, we always refer to the Blues Brothers scene where is it Joliet Jake sees the light. And that's when I decided to, you know, put down the XAML. <laughs> and step away from the XAML. <laughs> step away from the XAML. And, um, and that's when I decided, you know what, I'm going to go hardcore into this data science thing. One of the things I've noticed that has perplexed me is that other folks who are kind of doing what I used to do, you know, just regular uh, software engineering, they kind of poo poo the whole notion of like, that's, eh, you know, uh, Andy and I have a mutual friend and I was telling him like, oh yeah, so I've, you know, really focused on this kind of data science role. And he was kind of like, yeah, that's nice. Like I was doing something crazy. And I was like, you know, there was a time when Andy tried to get me into kind of the BI space where I had a similar reaction. So I wonder, since you, Dave, you go around uh, and you, you teach this to developers, I assume if they're in the seat, they're interested. But have you seen that kind of resistance? Not in the boot camp. I mean, because, you know, not to sound like a statistician, but there's obviously selection bias in the students in the boot camp. <laughs> they're, Very true. They're, they're paying good money to be there. So they've kind of self-selected to, to be into the data space. That being said, when I was working at Microsoft, I come from a traditional software engineering background myself. For many years, I pretended to stand on a pedestal and said, look, if you don't understand what a virtual destructor is, you're not a software engineer. Because I had that C++ thing going on. I've kind of mellowed since then, but what I did notice is that software engineers often do have a resistance to this idea because essentially so much of what you do in data science that actually makes things valuable isn't necessarily related to the core ideas that you learn in computer science. So I myself, I have a master's degree in computer science. Most of the techniques and tools that I learned in pursuing that educational credential not always applicable in data science. So I think inevitably it's just the manifestation of this human resistance to change. Hey, I'm an expert in .NET or C Sharp or object orientation or what have you. And there's this new thing coming down the pike and it's completely different. I'll have to retool, I'll have to reskill. And I think some of that just may be just good old fashioned human resistance to change. Uh, I saw it all the time in the org where Darren and I worked uh, that folks were like, well, I, you know, I'm, uh, this is, this is my value proposition. This is, this is how I bring value to the organization. And I've achieved a certain level of seniority, a certain level of rank based on that capability. And now you're asking me to retool and start over from scratch. It makes some people nervous. Other people get super excited by it. So it really runs the gamut. But the folks at the boot camp, they've self-selected. They're super passionate. They come from a wide variety of backgrounds. 
Uh, we have lots of folks that are data analysts with just primarily skills in Excel. We also have BI people, dyed in the wool BI people as well. And ranging all the way up to not too long ago, I was in DC and I had three PhDs in physics from the Department of Energy. I mean, it really runs the gamut of everybody who's getting into data science these days. Interesting. How do software engineers take to this new field? Because I know a lot of folks that listen to us, because we have such a similar mission statement to Data Science Dojo, a lot of our listeners are software engineers who mm -hmm. want to get into this space. Mm -hmm. So can you share some insight into how well do software engineering skills translate into this new space? They translate very well because, uh, and this will probably resonate with Andy, uh, in a very real way, everything that is old is new again. A lot of what we call data engineering has existed conceptually in the descriptive analytics space under the moniker of ETL for a long time. Obviously, if you're working with a true big data problem on the scale of Google or Facebook, there are computational aspects that are indicative of that, that data scale problem, and I don't want to diminish that. But in general, the idea of saying, I need to extract data or get data from a variety of sources. I need to clean it up. I need to set it up in a particular way and then feed it downstream to consumers of that data to do whatever it is that they need to do, whether that's dashboards or build machine learning models. Those skills as a software engineer are equally applicable to traditional ETL as well as quote unquote data engineering. So software engineering skills, building efficient code, understanding how to build a production system that works reliably, can be instrumented, absolutely 100% applicable. Now, what will be new, though, for many software engineers is, for example, the statistical aspects of data science, because many hardcore software engineers have little to no exposure to statistics. Um, that's just the nature of the beast, and it's absolutely fine. The, the good news is, is that you don't need a PhD in statistics to actually learn the core concepts that are useful 80% of the time. So any software engineer worth their salt can bootstrap into the skills that they need. I'll throw out this disclaimer. We're not priming guests with conversations about how much data integration plays a role in data science. Everyone who's working in data science or machine learning or AI, they already know this, and we're seeing it over and over again. It keeps coming up, and the reason is, as Wallace Nielsen pointed out in his book, Unicorns Among Us, which is, what, three years old now, data wrangling, data munging, it's 50 to 80% of the gig. We keep hearing that from folks on the show, and they're saying it because it's, you know, it's true. It's just from experience. Absolutely, I hear you about you know, kind of the multiple paths into data science. Software engineers, and that's Frank's background. He came to us as well from being a software engineer, although Frank's experience is a little, um, I think, a little unique because Frank was a user experience specialist, and the reason he's that way is he has a very good eye for, for art and communicating stuff graphically and visually. He's just always had that knack. And that's why I tried to get you into business intelligence, Frank, is because I realized right away, you know, the deliverable has always been the analytics or the report. I likened it to building a house, right? It's how you decorate the house, what color you paint the walls, you know, all of the things inside the house that make it really appealing and, and visually comfortable for the eyes and for people to live in. And Whereas this is the point in the show where we thank, thank our like sponsors myself, who make Data Driven possible. Of our time under the house. You know, on Data Driven, we talk a lot about data science machine learning, and artificial intelligence. But did you know the hardest part of any data science related project is data integration? Data scientists often call data integration, data wrangling, or the icky word munging. But it's all about making sure the analytics engine that you're using has valid and clean data. Enterprise Data and Analytics specializes in data integration and can help your enterprise build better data integration solutions faster with best practices and automation. Enterprise Data and Analytics offers training and consulting services for SQL Server Integration Services, SSIS, and Business Intelligence Markup Language, or BIML. Visit entdna.com to learn more. Enterprise Data and Analytics. Data. It's in their DNA. What's interesting is that how important reports are to any enterprise. I mean, the, the people that write the checks are the ones that make decisions based on what they see in the report. So I think reporting up until pretty recently has always been the Rodney Dangerfield of IT. It just gets no respect. I would 100% agree with that as a recovering descriptive analytics professional, if you will, and a minted data <laughs> scientist, I would absolutely say that that's, that's true, right? Now, nowadays, we use this idea of 
data storytelling, which again is maybe arguably some rebranding of some older ideas, and that's totally fine. But again, it, you, you hit the point, right? It, it is core. If you can't tell the story with the data to folks that are decidedly non-data savvy, you've essentially wasted effort. So whether that takes the form of a Power BI dashboard or Tableau or Spotfire or my favorite, ggplot2 in R, it doesn't really matter about the underlying technology. If you can't tell the story the right way that it resonates with the audience, you've wasted all that time and money. Right. And that is interesting that suddenly storytelling has been a big deal. I mean, it, it's not new, like you said, but suddenly now it has respect. Yeah, it does. And you'll see many blog posts in the blogosphere about the importance of if you're going to be a data scientist, you know, you you need the communication skills. Yes, you have to have technical acumen, but you also have to have these storytelling communication skills because most of the folks that actually cut the checks don't necessarily have the level of data skills that you do. So you have to be able to translate what you find in a way that they understand and resonates with them. That That's an invaluable skill. Now, arguably, that's an invaluable skill essentially for anybody in technology. But I think data science has really brought it again to the fore. Now, that's interesting. So it almost is like, the, you know, the unicorn of a data scientist is now even more of a valuable unicorn. You're not just looking for the unicorn, you're looking for the purple polka dotted unicorn that can speak French. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, certainly if you go to Indeed.com and you look up a data science job description, that certainly seems to be the case, <laughs> right? As like I like to tell people, you know, as a hiring manager myself in previous roles, don't be necessarily discouraged by these job descriptions because they're very often the manager's wish list. And if they're being realistic, they know they're not going to get the purple unicorn that has all the awesomeness in the world that you could possibly think of because we know they don't exist, but we still wish for it. Yeah, that's one thing Frank and I have we're talking about a few weeks ago, someone had reached out to us and they were looking for um, basically a unicorn. And, you know, we've discussed there's probably three or four areas of expertise that make up a data science unicorn. This person was definitely advertising for two. Frank and I were communicating about the job description. I think you may have gotten into it maybe eight seconds, Frank. And I said, this person's looking for two people. Do you think that businesses are ultimately going to say, you know what, we don't need one rock star. We need a baseball team. Do you think that shift is going to happen? Because you don't have to find unicorns if you can have a zebra, a horse, and a broomstick and some duct tape. Is that happening? I absolutely agree with that because early on in the Gartner hype cycle of data science, there was this Venn diagram. I'm sure everyone's seen it where one circle was mathematics, one circle was computer science, and one circle was subject matter expertise in the business. And at the intersection of all three of those circles was the data scientist. And quickly people realized that was the unicorn and they did not exist. Because if you spent your time and energy learning computer science to the, to the proper level of depth and mathematics to the proper level of depth, you probably didn't have any time to build the business subject matter expertise and vice versa. So you couldn't find someone that had the intersection of all three of those circles. So what I saw in particular at Microsoft and with lots of our students as businesses as well is that the business experts are a separate thing. They're a part of the team. And then what they concentrate on are those other two circles, the mathematics and the computer science. Now we're starting to figure out, as you alluded to, that even finding an intersection of those two at a sufficient level of breadth and depth is also very difficult. So maybe we separate that out. And you start to see that data engineering and data science has now kind of been essentially separated as well. And you see this in, especially in large scale organizations where data engineering teams are distinct things because that uh, a level of expertise all of its own. Data science, same thing. And it's very hard for you to be an expert in scaling out Apache Spark pipelines and making them awesome and also being able to build super robust productionalized models. So usually you say, okay, look, you know what? I need a data engineering team. I need a data science team. I need business subject matter experts. And then everybody works together to deliver the solution. Indeed.com is a good place to go and see this actually manifesting in the job postings you see. Interesting. So it's just a matter of time for kind of the market to adjust to what you're looking for does not exist. And you probably don't need one person with those skills anyway. We teach this to our students in our boot camp as well as we say, look, you know, the focus of our boot camp is primarily on data science, but don't necessarily discount data engineering. For example, right now, if you are a Spark expert, if you're a Scala wizard and you can do Spark, you're in higher demand than even a data scientist. Right now, your compensation is actually higher. So that shows you, I think the economics are kind of playing this out that, yep, specialization matters. We thought we were going to have the data scientists were going to be these generalists. Doesn't turn out that that's viable. We still need specialists. And then you see the economics being driven by that reality. I've seen the same thing around Spark. I've seen a lot of uh, jobs being advertised, a lot of people making statements similar to what you just made, that it's just hard to find somebody with expertise in that area. I take comfort in that because it's data integration and that's my specialty. So. 
<laughs> I'm, I'm happy that they're having trouble finding data integration experts, but at the same time, you know, a little bit of mixed emotions. I hate to see anybody stuck, especially a business, and trying to find someone to do that kind of work. In my last job at Microsoft, we actually spun up a Spark cluster, and we had a devil of a time finding resources to help bootstrap us into that new technology and then do knowledge transfer to our software engineers to get that skills in-house so we wouldn't have to constantly outsource it to high-end consultants. But even finding those consultants in the first place was difficult because of the rarity of the skill sets. So Andy, if you're interested in doing data integration, Scala and Spark, my man. Absolutely. Oh, I hear you. I accidentally fell into Scala and Spark because I'm taking the Microsoft Certified Data Scientist program. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And the capstone project is only offered once a quarter. And I was ready to take the test on, on May 1st, and then I realized, oh, I have to wait until July 1st. There's another smaller program, Certified Data Analyst, that Microsoft has, and that's all Spark, Scala, and all that. And that was a great opportunity for me to learn because I wanted to keep my skills sharp while I waited. Mm -hmm. And I, when I posted that on, you know, the various social media, I got a lot more attention than I thought I would because I just thought, you know, Spark is this thing and it's kind of big. But I was shocked to see the, the responses of like, wow, congratulations. Like, this was only three tests, you know, whereas the, the big data science program is 10 tests. Here's a cool thing to try. If you haven't done it already, put Scala and Spark on your LinkedIn profile and see how many emails you get because recruiters around the world are going to start pinging you like you would not believe. <laughs> It is interesting to see this flurry of, of, it's almost like a gold rush of, you know, people who have the right skills at the right time. Well, they're always highly in demand, but it's interesting to see that this, this is the new hotness. Yeah, I'm old enough to remember the original dot-com boom. It reminds me of back then when everyone was going into boot camps, bootstrapping into like being web developers. And it was a crazy, wild time. And I think we're seeing that to a certain extent also in the data science space. Also, now, as I said earlier, the data science and data engineering space now, because they're starting to become separated as two distinct specialities. I just wanted to refer back to Frank not sitting around waiting two months until the Capstone project started for the data science certification. There truly are no breaks on the F train. <laughs> there's no there's no breaks on the data train either that's right that's for sure data sleeps for no one oh i like that <laughs> oh that's great yeah yeah data sleeps for no one that's a laptop sticker right there <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah uh, Dave, one of the things we like to ask guests is what's the future of data science where do you see it going I'll be honest, I wouldn't presume to be DJ Patil, Hillary Mason, some of the luminaries in the field. I'll bring my perspective on it. I really believe that you're going to see what we currently term data science become far more ubiquitous across many, many roles. For example, my last job at Microsoft, I managed a technical PM team. Essentially, it was the PM team that ran all the data systems, the BI, data warehouse, the Hadoop cloud infrastructure, all that sort of thing. And I was exhorting my team to say, okay, look, the traditional skills that you have as technical PMs in this space, everything related to ETL and dimensional modeling, all the things that you, SQL, all the things you would expect, great foundation. You need to start branching out into more advanced analytics because technical program management, technical product management, just about every job you can think of, marketing analyst, you name it, the bar is being raised, right? If you're familiar with the Kano model, if your competitors are using things, you have to implement the same things just to keep up. Not to get ahead in the market, but just to keep up. So what I was telling my folks was, look, every role is going to have an ever-increasing higher level of data savviness as a requirement to do the role successfully. So start investing in that. And that's what I see the future of data science is saying, look, you know what? Not everyone's going to need to be able to build deep machine learning models to do automatic detection of cat videos or large-scale natural language processing like Siri. But being able to mine your event logs because every system in the world produces event logs. And if you're a product manager, you should be able to mine those event logs, use data science techniques to understand what's going on in your product and suggest improvements to it. Those types of skills, I think, are just going to become ubiquitous across the board. It's just going to be a level set raised across the board for everybody in there. And I think that's very exciting because not only does it give folks more skills and capabilities, but it also gives you the ability to unleash more business value because the more people that can use data to drive business value, the more business value you're going to get. I think that's really the future of data science. And that's what's got me really super excited. The Data Science Dojo, uh, are those camps in one location or is it a traveling show, so to speak? 
Yeah, it's, it's a traveling show. Yes. <laughs> it's a three ring circus of data science goodness. Ooh. Yeah. I don't know if my boss would like me to describe it that way. You can take that marketing plan for free on us. <laughs> okay. Appreciate that. It is a traveling boot camp right now. We do offer various cities around North America. For example, we have one coming up in Chicago in July, one coming up in New York City in July. We're doing Vegas in August, Toronto in August, Austin in September. So yeah, we do travel around North America and the rest of the world. We do boot camps in Dubai and in Singapore. We've done them in Europe. We're really kind of a global presence and we do that mainly because there's such broad interest in data science from all different kinds of roles and all different kinds of geographies. So we kind of move around, trying to make it convenient for our students to find a boot camp that'll work for them. Who makes an ideal student? Is it a software engineer? Do you tailor the content? Hey, we're going to have a bunch of biology PhDs here or something like that. We don't actually have an ideal student in terms of background. We take the idea of data science for everyone very seriously. So we don't custom tailor the curriculum for the students coming in because, for example, I was in Austin last week teaching and we had 42 students and they have very diverse backgrounds. And that's actually prototypical of our boot camps. So we have software engineers, we have PhDs from biology, PhDs in physics. I once taught a gentleman who had a PhD in recommender systems. And I taught him recommender systems, which was a little bit unnerving, as you might imagine. <laughs> so there myself saying, well, don't mess up, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> so we really do have a, a broad range of folks. So what we do is in the boot camp is we have a standard pre-boot camp curriculum of videos, about eight to 10 hours worth of training. If you already know R, if you already know Azure ML, then you don't have to do the pre-boot camp training. But if you do not, we offer those materials so that we can sit, level set everybody that comes to the boot camp with a certain foundational skill set. And then everybody starts day one at the same level. And then we proceed from there through the rest of the week. So you mentioned R quite a bit and you do a lot of videos on R. Is that the language? the course is in? We focus the boot camp on Azure ML and R. And we do that primarily for two reasons. One, as I mentioned, is just time. We have Python scripts in our GitHub repo, but we can't demo both the R and the Python at the same time because there's just not enough time. So we picked one, we chose R, just a conscious choice that we made. I'm an R guy, I'm an R aficionado, Python's great, but I like R better personally, so not surprisingly, we teach some R. But for those students that find R difficult because just of the syntax, maybe they don't have a strong coding background, we use Azure ML because of its dragon and drop visual and semantics. So we have the ability to allow the student to pick and choose which tool works best for their learning outcome, either the graphical-based Azure ML environment or the R environment. But we also have Python scripts in our GitHub repo for those folks that prefer Python. But during the week, we focus on Azure ML and R. I'm not looking to start a religious war between R and Python. I think it behooves to whatever language you choose that you focus on one at first. Mm -hmm. And then at your leisure, try to figure out how the other language does its thing. Last week in Austin, uh, I had a student who is in the financial services area and he wants to get into data science. And he was essentially asking me, should I learn R or should I learn Python? And I said, first and foremost, exactly what you indicated, Frank, which is pick one and stick with it. It is far more effective for you to be a master of one language than just okay at both. Right. So choose one and stick with it. And then I said, okay, and the next thing you need to do is you need to look at the economic reality of where you're planning on working. For example, if you're working in big pharma, they're predominantly R culturally. Python is starting to make inroads, but traditionally they've been big on R. So maybe it would make sense to learn R if that's what you were targeting. If you're targeting Silicon Valley startups, Python all the way, hands down. And I would be the first one to tell you that. Even though my preference is for R, I try to be as objective as I can when advising our students on which of the two languages they should be looking at as an area of focus. So did data find you or did you find data? It's probably a little bit of both. I have a background in software engineering. My first paying gig as a coder was COBOL on an IBM mainframe. So that tells you a little bit of how long, wow. I've, been in the, how long I've been in the business. So my background is actually hardcore software engineering. But my first exposure, I think, in my career to what later became my data addiction was a project where I was leading an implementation of a customer data master solution, right? A, a single database of the customers for a corporation. One of the features that we implemented of this customer data master was probabilistic deduplication. For example, if a record comes in and it says David Langer, and a record comes in and it says Dave Langer, what's the probability that those two people are the same so that we can actually line them up in the customer master, not have duplicate records. It's a common problem in enterprises. Customers are duplicated everywhere. That really illustrated to me for the first time, maybe there's more to implementing technology to drive the business than just building systems. It's also, maybe there's this aspect of how well the data is actually 
curated and can be used is super important as well. So that actually got me interested in what we call now descriptive analytics or BI. So have a background in BI, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a Kimball fan, that sort of thing. Did that for a number of years. Uh, later on in my career, I was pursuing my master's degree in computer science, and I was lucky enough to take an intro to machine learning course that was taught by a gentleman who was a member of the second place Netflix prize team. So I don't know if your audience is familiar oh, with the wow. Netflix prize, but about back in 2006, Netflix offered a million dollar prize to anyone that could improve their recommender system by just 10%. That spawned a huge competition worldwide. All these teams were competing to win. And what you saw was that the, their progress would, it would get blocked. So they would actually join up. They would start combining their solutions. And you started seeing this pyramid effect. The number of teams decreasing, but the size of teams getting larger as people banded together to blend their solutions to start driving further improvements. So he was part of the second place Netflix prize team. So extremely knowledgeable on uh, machine learning and the practicalities of actually implementing real world solutions. And he got me absolutely hooked on data at that point because what he taught me was these data warehouses, these data marts that I've been building, I could use them as crystal balls and predict the future. And I was like, okay, I, I thought BI was pretty cool, but holy cow, this data science thing, wow. And from that point forward, I was totally obsessed. So yeah, I think a little bit of both. Maybe data found me and I found data. I think you nailed it with a data addiction. Once you have a, a taste of kind of what you can do with data, it's hard to put it down. Oh yeah, absolutely. And then our next question is, what's your favorite part of your current gig? That's actually pretty easy. Uh, I love teaching. So I get to meet lots of great people that are doing all kinds of interesting things and they come to our boot camps at Data Science Dojo from all over the world. There's nothing quite like just flying to a city and knowing for an entire week, I'm gonna be geeking out with people on data science, getting them excited about the possibilities, uh, giving them skills that I know that they're gonna be able to go back to their organizations and use to drive business value. That's hands down the best part of the job, absolutely. When I'm not working, I enjoy blank. Uh, I enjoy travel with good company. I'm lucky enough that my wife and I, we get to travel with our best friends and we get to go to lots of cool places. Uh, my wife and I also travel with my brother and his wife. And so we get to go to places in Europe and that also helps that my job involves travel too right now. So that's also a cool part of the gig. But I really like going to new places, seeing new cultures, experiencing new foods and getting perspectives on history and the world that are distinctly different than being a white guy from the Seattle area. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh, and I like playing video games a lot. So cool. Just... What's your favorite right now? So right now I'm playing a lot of Neverwinter on the PS4, which is a Dungeons and Dragons game. So make no mistake, I am a first class nerd. First class. <laughs> that that's how we like to do things here at Data Driven. First class. Yeah. Our next question is: uh, I think the coolest thing in technology today is blank. Yeah, so without a doubt, I think the coolest thing in technology right now, in my opinion, is SQL Server 2016 R services. And here's the way I think about it. I, I think about this not just as a former Microsoft employee, but generally speaking, as a former SQL Server stack data professional. When I think about all of those data warehouses and data marts sitting out there in organizations with all that value, just waiting to be unleashed when you marry it up with R and R services. I mean, it just, it gets me positively giddy. I mean, <laughs> just, yeah, just thinking about it. I think that's hands down the coolest thing right now in tech. I think that is the most overlooked value proposition for data professionals right now is saying, look, if you've got a SQL Server data warehouse or a data mart, get yourself some R services, hook those two things up and start getting some business awesomeness going with your data. So our last complete this sentence is I look forward to the day when I can use technology to I look forward to the day where the computer can automate the constructions of my solutions. And I mean everything from the data pipelines to feature engineering to model training. I like writing code. I consider myself an artiste, as many software engineers do, right? As I write code, as I craft it. But it does slow me down. So it would be awesome if AI and natural language processing got to the point where it was a very Star Trek-like experience where I could just talk to the computer and have it actually write out the code for me. And I just think about what I would like it to do, think about the features I wanna engineer, the models I wanna build, and I have to focus so much on actually thinking about what I wanna do and then taking the time to code it up myself. I think that would be super awesome. And I think arguably, if you look at the history of technology anyway, it's replete with examples of how 
adding layers of abstraction just increase productivity. That's the that's the productivity increase that I'm waiting for. That's an awesome answer. <laughs> <laughs> and our final question is share something different about yourself that you like to do. And remember, we are a family podcast and we like to keep our iTunes clean rating. Yeah, that's true. And, I, and my wife might listen to this. So that's another reason to be cognizant of the response. Okay. So I'm, I have to admit this because you asked. I am a terrible golfer. I, I am horrendous. I am pitiful. I have been playing golf for years, but I never improve. <laughs> but, <laughs> but nevertheless, it does not stop me from heading out and stinking up the course, you know, on, on an almost weekly basis with my best friend I, during the summer months here in Seattle. He loves to golf. He's far more athletically inclined than I am. And he just looks at me with sadness in his eyes <laughs> as I hack up the course. <laughs> <laughs> so it seems like you need to train your uh, neural network on some golf moves. Exactly. So, oh, maybe that should have been my response to the previous question, right? I need like a, <laughs> I need a bio, I need a, I need a mechanical exoskeleton to improve my swing. Oh, well, there you go. Or like in the Matrix, I know kung fu. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, that would be great. Just so you know, Dave, it's not a data-driven show until there's at least three, maybe four movie references. Oh, absolutely. I, I, do, I drop them all the time. For example, I use Cornflower Blue as an example in our boot camps all the time. Ah. You'd, be, you'd be surprised how many people don't get the Fight Club reference. <laughs> <laughs> First rule of Data Club, you don't talk about Data Club. Oh, we talk about that in the boot camp too, right? I, I, say, I say, look, you're all part of the club now, people. You have to accept all of your cookies. You never delete them, and you fill out every form in its entirety. <laughs> you got to cuz you got to pay the data forward people you got to pay the data forward. <laughs> I like that. So uh where can folks find out more about what you're up to Dave? Yeah, so the easiest way to find out what I'm up to is to check out datasciencedojo.com. Uh that you can go find out where I'll be teaching next in the boot camps. Uh you can also find me on LinkedIn as well. Thanks for listening to Data Driven. Don't just listen, become a data driver by going to datadriven.tv to sign up to join the community, access to special events, tips and tricks, and more. Sign up today at datadriven.tv.